Hello and welcome to Smith and Sheridan on Biotech, a podcast on the science and business of biotechnology presented by me, Cormac Sheridan. And me, Andy Smith. Hello, Cormac. Hi, Andy. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. So this week we are talking about gene therapy. You, in a note you sent me, you have a very provocative title, which is quite nicely phrased, The Stunted Promise and Ambition of Gene Therapies. That sounds like a bit of a tale of woe. (laughs) What's your take on where we're at? Given that, obviously, there have been a whole bunch of approvals. There have been a bunch of transactions, profitable for some, not for others. Some patients are getting treated and hopefully having good outcomes. Although I must say, things tend to be a little bit opaque once these therapies get approved. It's very hard to see kind of real world data about the actual effects on patients' lives. Certain gene therapies seem to work beautifully. Others tend to be a bit more of a mixed bag. But anyway, what's your take on where the field is at right now? I mean, I I guess it's a sort of a learning the lessons kind of rolling up the sleeves and getting on with it, it seems to me, is what the the industry is doing. And my perspective... It's slanted to a slight extent. Having worked in a pricing and market access consultancy, I did one of the original pricing and market access studies with US and European payers on one of the first CAR-T therapies. So having talked to payers, where we are in gene therapy is, I mean, moving back to the very beginning, it offered so much promise and certainly still does offer so much promise where you can have an injection of one agent with that one therapy, that one and done or one or therapy cures a patient of what are some of the most intractable diseases inherited mutations that results in shortened lifespans and disability and very expensive health care so a one and done shot for those has a lot of promise but going back on your summary to date that promise is still underwhelmed would, would you agree yeah because i think that one and done metaphor which sort of summarizes the promise isn't completely truthful it's misleading it's one and done for a while and we're not quite sure how long we don't know how long these vectors manage to persist within those cells that manage to be transduced by the vector Mm -hmm. and there's two problems around efficacy and potency kind of wrapped up into that. A, how much of the target organ is actually receiving the corrective genetic cargo? Is it 10%? Is it 1%? Is it 50%? And B, for how long will it stay there? And there's huge uncertainties around the latter in particular. I mean, it's reasonably possible to measure your transduction efficiencies, I think, at this stage. But in terms of the duration of effect, we've seen with some of the hemophilia gene therapies, they start off great, and there's a very rapid decline in the effects of these therapies. Five years is kind of what the gene therapy developers are sort of standing over. I don't think they're standing over anything other than that. I think that there was a sort of a, a certain simplistic way in which these extremely complicated therapies were presented to people. It was just a sort of a genetic Lego kind of a trick. And it's much, much, much more complicated to create a pharmaceutical product that does what it does safely and effectively and can be made at a reasonable cost and shipped to large numbers of patients or whatever numbers of patients are involved. And and I think we're still feeling our way, or at least the industry is still feeling its way on on what's safe and effective and reasonably value generating and manufactured gene therapy looks like. But you're you're absolutely right. And part of feeling that way relates to even the second generation gene therapies that, as you say, most drugs you know, make their way to the liver for detoxification. Any or, or many gene therapy vectors will make their way to liver cells because they're seen as foreign or they're seen as drugs or something that needs to be detoxified. And then they will exert their gene insertions there. And that brings the issue, right? Because liver cells turn over. So over time, you'll see that some of these gene therapies for for haemophilias A and B will decline their effectiveness over time. And that brings big issues to the sector, which is still grappling with. And you hinted in your introduction, certainly on paying. 
for them. So a payer is going to reimburse two to three million dollars for a gene therapy for haemophilia A, when in five years the patient needs those products or needs to go back on therapy again. And that's that's really hard for payers to think about, right? Because payers don't get paid in one go for the lifetime of their patient. They get annual budgets. So when you're trying to recoup two or three or four million dollars of a one-off gene therapy by a manufacturer but from a payer a payer is going to say well i don't get paid you know for that patient's therapy and even the existing therapies don't get paid all in one go they get paid over the lifetime of the patient so that issue of duration comes into play at the very earliest stages of of reimbursement discussions even before that but even before a product gets approved so we have still to live that down. And as you, you mentioned in your introduction, I would go a bit further than what you said. Companies are a bit cagey on how many patients are being dosed and what revenues are generated from that. I mean, if you look at CSL and Uniquire, they had a product approved. They mentioned in the last, or CSL mentioned in its last earnings announcement, that it's dosed a handful, two, three of patients, but did not record any sales. And Bluebird Bio as well is incredibly cagey about what revenues they're generating from these products that were approved in the last year. So, yes, lots of moving parts yeah. still to move out. The, yeah, I mean, Bluebird did, to be fair, disclose in their second quarter earnings that I think on their Dysona product for cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy that mm. I think five patients had had their hematopoietic stem cell and progenitor cells removed for the gene therapy step to be undertaken. And I think on the beta thalassemia side, at the same time, I think about 11 patients had, had started therapy. Again, I'm not sure if they'd received the actual construct, but they certainly had initiated therapy. So, but, but you are talking handfuls. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and the important point you mentioned there is that patients need, in some of these therapies, yeah. not, not all of them, some of them need reconditioning, right? They need yeah. the same sort of procedures that would happen on a, a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So they need intensive monitoring and hospitalized care the cost of that is what i'm saying before they even get to the the price of the product so these are the one-off doses because yeah. as you also mentioned you know a lot of the vectors will preclude repeat dosing but their expenses are largely hidden and as you mentioned again in your introduction the number of patients benefiting you would expect them to be walking among us shouting from the rooftops like, oh, i got a gene therapy and i'm cured and i've not seen that yet no, not yet. I mean, there have been some instances, obviously, where they have been very successful. But I take a point about the preconditioning regimen to knock out the existing bone marrow to enable the transduce cells to expand and grow rapidly so that you get a therapeutic benefit and they don't get kind of washed away by, by the existing lymphocyte repertoire in the patient. And I know companies are focusing quite an amount of effort to try to introduce milder preconditioning regimens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be safer and easier because there is a very, very finite amount of infrastructure. I remember trying to get this number, and I think in a place as vast as the USA, I think it's only maybe a couple of tens of thousands of patients who can undergo this in any given year. So in a smaller country, it's got to be in the hundreds. Yeah. I mean, I know that these are mostly, but not entirely, relatively rare diseases, but I think it's going to be very interesting to see where you have slightly more prevalent conditions with therapies coming through, such as, say, for example, sickle cell disease, which mm -hmm. in, in the countries where it's most prevalent, there were relatively large numbers of patients. And I think in, in sickle cell, I think there's real, real, real promise there. It's a dreadful disease and the existing standard of care is very, very limited and there has been some hopeful signs that there will be progress there. But I, I also think, though, that the gene therapies that are coming through the approval process now will find themselves under immense competitive pressure from the gene editing therapies that are just mm. coming up behind them. And obviously, it's going to be potentially real milestone for the biotech industry later this year because there's a PDUFA date in December coming up for the gene editing therapy which CRISPR Therapeutics is developing with Vertex for sickle cell disease. Exocell is the mm. sort of shorthand name for it. That has looked very promising in clinical trials. And if that kind of maintains its momentum, I think that could change an awful lot, couldn't it? 
Yeah, it could to trickle down into indicators that have larger patient populations rather than the ultra rare orphan diseases brings other issues as well. When we talked about vaccines, that they have to be very, very safe because they're given to healthy volunteers, millions in the case of the COVID vaccines, billions of healthy volunteers. Same is true when you expand a patient population from something that's ultra rare and probably fatal and disability reigns in, in those sorts of indications then the, the cost benefit issue or the safety benefit issue is slightly different to when you take people that can be adequately treated, although expensively treated, fair enough, adequately treated like sickle cell, like haemophilia B with a larger number of patients. And let's take a step back. The whole safety issue of gene therapy was marred by generation one that was largely done by academic centers and resulted in cancers in patients bubble boys that died because in those days and to some extent even now you try and insert a gene into a patient's genome and if you don't get it right or even if it's even if it's a small part of the gene or a homologous correction it it might go in the wrong place and if it goes in the wrong place in the cell it could cause a mutation that can cause some blood cancers or some other cancers and that has happened And, and one of the things that characterizes the safety perspective of gene therapies even today and gene editing companies is that clinical holds are de rigueur they seem to be dropped at any opportunity and patients have died and i know that bluebird and i think it's vertex that have talked about when they have clinical hold to put on and they satisfy that with review of the data and the trial gets back on you know that the companies say we're satisfied that it wasn't our therapy that caused the patient to die or caused the cases. But I'm yet to hear from regulators to whether they believe that's the case as well. You know, the companies might be happy because they can conflict it, right? But the FDA, the bastion of drug safety, you don't hear it from them saying, oh, yeah, we're perfectly happy. Go ahead. I thought, though, when the clinical hold was lifted on the Bluebird therapy that the FDA said it was unlikely that the cancer arose due to an insertional issue. I do think with the therapies for blood-related disorders, there is a sort of a higher risk of some form of lymphomas or myelodysplastic syndrome to occur because there's a sort of a rebound effect that occurs. Mm -hmm. Their bone marrows are just churning out red blood cells at a much higher rate than would be the case in a normally healthy person because the people are anemic. And that creates inherent risks anyway, I think, as well. And hats off to the FDA and the companies for the, for their diplomacy, because the FDA will say, it is unlikely. And the companies would say, we do not believe our product is a masterclass in diplomacy from those yeah. two. And there's a real departure between haemophilia A and haemophilia B, oddly enough. Numbers of patients being the least issue. But also the duration of effect. By Marin's Rotavian, which was approved just back in June, and I know that there are blockbuster sales forecasts attached to that product, and that's approved in hemophilia A, that showed sort of a very marked decline in an effect on patients. Whereas the Unicure product, which they developed with CSL bearing in hemophilia B, seems to maintain its efficacy over over seems to have a greater duration of effect and, and also less diversity amongst the actual patients. I think with the Bimarin, some patients had a good response and others didn't, and it wasn't very clear why that was the case. So I, I think it's going to be a very interesting rollout. I mean, they, they have kind of ambitious forecasts and plans for that product, but uh, some in the field are still a little bit dubious about how good it's going to be. And if there's some other better options that are Coming along the pipeline, some patients may opt to wait if they're doing okay right now on recombinant factor eight. And, and, it, and it does illustrate where we are right now in you know, after 20, 20 odd years of some sort of gene therapies or clinical gene therapies. Where we are right now in almost November 2023 is still a critical time for gene therapies because there are companies not reporting sales. We don't know how well they've done. We don't know how many are selling. We don't know how many patients are treated. We don't know how much they're getting paid for it. And we still might not know at the end of this earnings season. You can still be a bit cagey about it for a bit longer. But Yeah, the archetypal so far, gene therapy, um, Novartis's Zolgen uh, for spinal muscular atrophy has been on the market for a number of years. 
And what we saw was sales grew quite nicely to what some people said are most of the worldwide sales of gene therapy products. And the last two quarters, Novartis have reported sales going down because they mentioned the phrase that I'm sure gene therapies will despise worldwide. Is that they're now treating an incident population, which you know I've commented on, translates into investors thinking the product of the company you're invested in is waiting to be sold to the next patient when they are born which is not what you expect from biopharmaceutical products. You expect to have a highly prevalent market rather than an incident market that waits for those patients identified by postnatal screening that need the gene therapy. It's a different world with very rare diseases than it is for haemophilia B, for example. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, they're on track to achieve blockbuster sales this year, right? 928 million revenues in the first nine months. That must be the best-selling gene therapy by far. Oh, yeah. And apparently it does the job. That, that you don't see it here, patients coming back or, or patients yeah. needing other therapies. So you know, it, it's a great thing. But if you're a Novartis investor and mm. you're thinking next year and the year after, if this year was the peak of sold gen- gen- mm. sales, then you're thinking, well, what's next from gene therapy? Yeah, and I know Novartis paid $8.7 billion to acquire the original developing company of Exus, which is a lot of cash. And that might point to the sort of overly stoked expectations around gene therapy. I mean, this was a patient population that it's pretty well known, the prevalence, and it wasn't a a difficult to estimate market. So I think they paid a lot of money for it. But I guess they were buying expertise as well as that actual single program. There are other programs as well, which I think they've taken some write-offs for actually in some of their financial reporting um, but i think i think Cormac, you're you're uh, you're giving business development directors more credit than they are due i worked for a pharmaceutical company once where the commercial people looked at an indication for a product and we said nah nah that is, we can't we did we spent thirty thousand dollars on market research and there aren't many patients out there and the chief ex said said i don't care just go and do the deal buy the company so you know sometimes people do these and you, you hark back to the a different market, a different time, a different valuation for assets. And perhaps without the benefit we've seen of a number of five or so more years of gene therapies. So would they do it again today for the same price? Almost certainly not. What the tragedy might be is that as we start to see not just the reimbursement, but the safety and duration issues that are associated, we talked about with, with gene therapies, as they become more obvious for ultra rare and orphan therapies we might not get products developed for those indications and people go after bigger indications instead that that would be a tragedy but at the same time too i think we taking the optimistic view over time you may not be using a viral vector anymore to deliver a genetic payload and you may not also be trying to get a big lump of dna into the nucleus of a cell within a target organ system I mean, gene therapy in this kind of, no, I shouldn't use the word gene therapy, genetic medicine or molecular medicine, which can encompass the delivery of siRNA, antisense oligonucleotides, gene editing components, and mRNA. And they will be delivered typically to the cytoplasm, except DNA needs to go to the nucleus. Those delivery challenges are less. The packaging challenges are less. So that Now, obviously, if you have an inherited disease, a monogenic disorder arising from mutation, you will need to correct that mutation. But there are incredibly clever RNA editing approaches being undertaken as well, which potentially could achieve a similar outcome, except that it's done on a repeat basis in a way that, say, siRNA is dosed maybe every few months or something like that. And okay, those programs are still at an early stage, but we're seeing data in non-human primates, for example, which are pretty good model systems for humans, suggesting that these things, A, are deliverable, and B, they persist. So that all the dollars and expertise that's gone into the, the first wave of gene therapy product companies, it doesn't all revolve around the product revenues generated by the products that have emanated from those companies. I mean, there's there's other expertises um, in manufacturing and preclinical development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that are really important for bringing on the next wave of therapies. And I'm calling them genetic medicines to differentiate them from, from classical gene therapy. And I think there are real grounds for optimism. And, and then turning to the sort of non- viral vector piece 
We all know, obviously, that lipid nanoparticles are awesome delivery vehicles for getting mRNA into the cytoplasm of certain cells. That really works for vaccines, as we have all experienced, many of us at least, I would hope. And okay, getting DNA into an LNP and getting that delivered to the nucleus is a, a wholly different ballgame. I know people are trying to do it, but there's other really clever little approaches that are still early stage, but you've companies like, say, Aerith Therapeutics, which raised quite a bit of cash this year, I think, to develop these protein based nanoparticles, mm-hmm. which are derived from endogenous proteins that are encoded in in you and me and every other human being and these are non-immunogenic and they're little sort of capsid like structures that spontaneously kind of uh, form it's kind of like a sort of a, a vaccine like particle type of a, mm. a setup and there's other really ingenious ways i've seen people using dna itself as a nano carrier mm. and these are really interesting because they're cell-free manufacturing highly tunable early stage but there's a kind of a vista here that's huge and broad. And, and never mind the efforts to engineer the AAV capsids as well for, for selective delivery across the blood-brain barrier and, and, and other approaches. So I think there are reasons for optimism, despite the sort of, say, the bumpy commercial rollout of the first wave of products. I agree. And I, I like your summary because it illustrates how far we've come how far we still got to go and to any aliens tuning into this podcast thinking is that the best the human race can do in gene therapy we haven't scratched the surface as you said on non-viral delivery yet there are exosomes there are non-viral lmps that can deliver things and, and we've moved beyond trying to chuck massive genes into a a human that may not work or may produce the wrong things and there's gene editing which is a bit more sophisticated and can still use lmp delivery so yeah i mean we're not halfway through yet on exhausting human ingenuity on gene therapy and as far as i'm aware no alien civilization has had to put up with the expectations of wall street which uh, obviously kind of makes things trebly difficult yeah. And, and if you are an alien tuning in and you do know the answer to delivery and, and gene therapy, let some biotech company know and we'll, we'll jump ahead. I think that's as good a note to end as any other. Until the next time, Andy, thank you. Cheers, Cormac. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.